Hey fellow brain pickers, how would you like to get featured as a guest on multiple podcast shows like this one and get massive exposure? Getfeatured.media will get you featured on targeted shows. They'll design a custom bio page, pitch you to the hosts, schedule a time, prepare you for the shows and promote you so you get even more brand exposure. Head over to getfeatured.media to get major publicity for your brand. Welcome to the Can I Pick Your Brain podcast, where successful entrepreneurs get their brains picked so you can apply mindset tricks and game-changing tactics that will help you become unstoppable. Now, here's your host, Daniel Geffen. Hi, fellow brain pickers, and welcome to episode 61 of Can I Pick Your Brain? My guest today lives life in the front row. In fact, his mission is to share his front row experience with as many people as time permits. He has raised over $1 million for his charity, the Front Row Foundation, which helps children and adults with life-threatening illnesses have a front row experience at the concert or sporting event of their dreams. Life's too short to live in the back seat. And it's people like John Vroman that inspire others who are afraid to stand up tall and go from spectator of life to a contributor of life. We don't always choose our seat in life, but we can always choose to have a front row experience. John Vroman is an award-winning motivational speaker, author, philanthropist, personal coach, ultra-marathon runner, entrepreneur, front row usher, and podcast host. But most importantly, he is a father to two boys, Tiger and Ocean, and husband to a lucky lady named Tatiana. John, welcome to the show, and thanks for letting me pick your brain. Oh, thanks for having me. That was awesome. I was <laughs> smiling, mostly when you started talking to me about my kids. That was great. By the way, it's Tiger, not Tigger, right, from Winnie the Pooh? Tiger, yeah. Okay, tiger and I'm ocean. so yeah, happy. We I went was, very traditional. I was gonna say, I'm so, <laughs> when I when I saw that when I saw that I was like, Tiger and Ocean. Those are very unique names. Can, can you just before we get into to the to the uh, podcast show, what what was the reasoning be, behind those two names? They're very specific. Yeah. Well, actually, you know what's cool is that this really is the essence of uh, what we'll probably get into, and that okay. is being able to live a life that you're proud of, that you uh, step up to, that you live from a very present and powerful state. When we chose their names, we decided that the first decision of their lives um, to choose their names would not be one that would be made out of fear, but one that would be made with our hearts and made in a powerful way that uh, that we would be able to tell them that story forever. And so that's why we chose the names the way we did. This was literally led from our hearts. That's so cool. So Tiger, I guess, represents, uh, you know, the beast of the animal kingdom. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting. It was more about a feeling than it was about what that word would represent, per se. My wife and I, we would throw out names and we would say, we would literally just say, okay, we're going to say names out loud. And when you have a, oh yeah, feeling <laughs> about the name, just, just chime in, right? Like, love that. And mm -hmm. when we both we both had that reaction to each of our children's names, and I remember with Ocean, we even said, you know, I said Ocean, and because we had um, uh, we know a guy whose name is Ocean, an older gentleman, and uh, and and sh and we both were like, I love that. And then we paused <laughs> for a minute. We're like, Are we really going to name our son Ocean? <laughs> and you have that fear set in about what others might say or what they might, um, how they might judge you. Mm -hmm, but it's sure. you know, it, it, interesting. People will people will perpetuate that fear by saying things like, well, I mean, if you name emotion, he's definitely never going to grow up to be a lawyer or, you know, uh, something like that. And mm -hmm. you go, I don't know, because I don't know that when, you know, for in the, anybody listening that might be in the US or, or, or around the world that would know it's like. Uh, you know, when Barack Hussein Obama was a kid, I don't think people were like, that's pro that's a presidential name. <laughs> I don't think it, hey, that's right there. The future president of the United States of America. I don't think so. Right. Right. And, and I have we to say, though, name. Ocean Vroman just sounds like a really cool either musician or actor. So, you know, he's, he's got <laughs> right. definitely on right. the money there. So that's awesome. Can you share with our audience, I guess, for those that, that are listening that don't know your background, what's your background? What's your story? Because I know you were born in, in Japan, which is really cool. Yep. 
Yeah, a short story is I grew up in a military family. Dad was a captain in the Navy. We traveled around every couple of years to a new spot. Um, started out in Japan, you know, and and uh, and I was there until about five. So I remember little bits and pieces. One of the funniest things about telling people I was born in Japan was that when I was about maybe six or seven years old, I remember being very confused as to why I wasn't Japanese. I was like, wait a minute, I'm born in Japan. Why am I not Japanese? I couldn't quite piece that together. But, uh, you know, my, I had a great childhood. I, I, you know, I spent, um, I spent a lot of days being very happy as a kid. Uh, later in my teens, it got a little rougher. Um, I wasn't growing physically. Like I literally, my body wasn't maturing. I went to the doctor at 16. I went to an endocrinologist who said I had the bone age of a nine-year-old when I was oh 16. Goodness. I was 4'10", and I weighed 85 pounds. Mm-hmm. So I looked like I was nine when I was in high school. And Ooh, that was, uh, was an interesting experience because... I felt, uh, I didn't feel good about myself. I had very low self-esteem. Uh, I didn't really fit in. And, and then I went through a couple different phases of my life, um, all de- you know, where I felt like I was really in the back row as I describe it now. And that to mm-hmm. me is just somebody who's just disengaged from life and um, you know, watching it all happen. And that was, how, that was how my life felt until I had some experiences in my 20s and, and 30s that would change that and I would have a massive transformation in the way I view myself and my place in the world. And we can get into any of that that you want, but, but ultimately that's sort of the story um, that brought me to where I am. It's a, it, my story now is rooted in a lot of insignificance, pain, fear, and feeling like I wasn't worthy. And now I have a passion for helping people mm-hmm. feel important, noticed, witnessed, celebrated, and I feel like that's turning the, the, the challenge into the triumph. Well, I mean, just, just for me, I'm just listening to you and I'm, I, I'm in a bit of disbelief because it, it, as those of you listening, my intro, I said that John Roman is an award-winning motivational speaker, which, which means you get up on stages and front, in front of, what was the biggest audience you've, you've stood in front of? Uh, I, I don't know, thousands? Thousands, right. So you've stood in front of thousands of people. And, and, and I, I know the feeling because I, I think I've, I haven't done it enough and I want to. Like one of my, my passions is to definitely get on stage and speak. Um, but I know that when you get on that stage, you literally feel like you're walking out naked. I don't know why, but it's just all those people. And the, Can you share actually with us, just, just for the sake of it, the first time you ever got on stage, what did it feel like? Can you take us through that? Oh, um, yeah, the first time? Actually, you know what? I remember the first time I think I was officially given the platform to to share a message. And that was mm-hmm. when I was probably 19 or 20. I had um, started working for a direct sales company um, that sells Cutco knives. And I was literally like, these are high-end knives. I'd <laughs> sell them in people's homes and then try to get referrals to their friends and go do the same thing over and over again. And I remember uh, I was asked to give a speech at a weekly team meeting to probably what was eight people that were there. Mm-hmm. And I remember remember feeling such a sense of maybe um, importance to that moment, like what I was about to say could potentially really help somebody. I don't know that I felt in that moment particularly, I, I don't know if I felt a lot of emotion for myself or feeling nervous in that way is more uh, like about not wanting to waste people's time. Like mm, if yeah. I had the mic and I was in front of them, I wanted to give them something of great value. So I was nervous to waste their time more than anything, to right. not deliver something of great value. But I remember that moment very, very well. And it went fine. And I, I don't know that it was It's certainly not going to go down in the history of one of the great speeches ever given. <laughs> but, um, but I remember how I felt. And I felt a sense of importance with that moment. And then so, since then, there's been all sorts of different emotions <laughs> speaking, including a time, Daniel, where I bombed on stage in front oh, of about 800 no. people. And How? I'll never forget that moment because that was one of the most terrifying as a speaker. I lost my place in the middle of the speech and just froze. Oh. And I was already a seasoned professional speaker. It's a whole long story. I, I won't get into it now. But but that moment was also very enlightening for me to say that just because you're a professional speaker doesn't mean that you don't have moments where, you know, you might, uh, yeah, you might be challenged in front of a room. Um, but uh, I how learned did you, a lot from that you, experience and, you know, and, and grew. 
How did you bounce back though? Or did it completely fail and you walked off stage? I mean, when you bombed, yeah. were you just standing there like a lemon or did you, <laughs> did uh, you kind of, I, here's what happened. I'll tell you the, I'll tell you the short version of the story. Mm-hmm. We can spend as much time as here as you want, because it's really a fascinating story. Mm-hmm. I had given the speech so many times. It was, uh, I knew it forward, backward, in and out. But what happened was about five to 10 minutes into the speech, I was almost on autopilot with the speech. That's Ah. what sometimes happens when you, when you do it so many times, I was on autopilot and because I could say the words almost without thinking about them, my brain had the ability to go somewhere else Hmm. because I wasn't totally present to the moment. My brain went somewhere else. And when my brain went somewhere else, I started giving that attention. So here's what happened. I was walking down the aisle and I said, what would happen if I just totally forgot where I was in my speech? And I literally gave that thought so much attention that I was like, oh my gosh, I'm literally, it's happening right now. This is what's happening in my head. I'm literally saying, oh my gosh, I'm about to do it. I'm going to give all that attention and it's happening and it's getting louder and more amplified. And the next thing you know, it got so loud in my head, I lost my place. I was like, I don't even know where I was going with that. Now, I probably only lost my place for like five seconds. Right. But to me, it felt like an eternity to the crowd. They probably didn't notice it a ton, but here's what they did notice. What I think they did notice was that my energy shifted. See, I felt like they noticed. I felt like I was not giving my best speech. Mm-hmm. And I started then, rep- my energy started um, exuding that same type of inser- insecurity um, which then I think affected the outcome of the speech. Now there's a bunch of people in that crowd that would have told you that was the best speech they've ever heard and it was fine and they all clapped at the end type of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I say bomb, I say that relatively because for me, that was a terrifying moment. Um, I don't think it was my best speech ever by far, but what ended up happening, Daniel, was that after that, every time I'd go back to give the speech, I was terrified then that it could happen again. Right. And my hands would start sweating and I would have these thoughts and I would, I would literally get to the same spot in the speech and I would get terrified because I now had an an anchor to that moment. But here's how I changed it. I (laughs) wrote myself an affirmation because I know how my brain works. Like I just studied enough to know how my brain works. And I'd used all these, um, if your audience would know this, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, something yep. I learned in the Tony Robbins organization a decade ago. Mm-hmm. And I used these techniques where I would um, recondition myself to um, think something else before, during, and after my speech so that I could essentially um, eradicate that limiting belief or that thought or that fear. Right. Yeah. And so I wrote this pre-speech affirmation and I would read this over and over and over again before I would take the stage. I could tell you what it is, by the way, if you want to know. Yeah, I'd love to know. I was going to ask you. And, and I think this is really important for people because this is all part of living a front row life. We teach about managing your mindset. Uh, the, mm-hmm. And by the way, the concept of an affirmation isn't new. Um, but what I also think happens that's that's a tragedy is that people, because they think it's not new, they think it's not effective. Right. They want that. Right. So I was like, let me use what I know works. And uh, that's what I came up with. So here's what it was. It says, I'd read this every time I take the stage. I say, I am a moment maker. I'm a born storyteller. It's now time to be off self and on purpose. Right now, I'm asking the universe to guide me during my speech today. I ask for support in being present and authentic in my delivery. What I intend to share is my true story, my interpretation of life, my humorous observations, and my core values. I'm sharing today because I want to encourage, challenge, and inspire my audience. Today, I want to connect so that I can enrich their lives in some small way. I will trust myself and speak from the heart. This speech isn't supposed to be like any other. Just go with the flow. Feel your next move. You love variety and give a positive meaning to any situation. Everything that happens is a tool for teaching. Capitalize on offers. I can explain that later. State Mm -hmm. your point with simplicity. Breathe. I now give myself to be to I now give myself permission to have fun, smile big and bring light to the room. I was brought here for a reason and I'm focusing my energy on the person that needs this message to have a breakthrough and create their new life starting now. I have full confidence. I'll say exactly what needs to be said in the way I need to say it. I'm here to fulfill a mission. This moment is my calling. This is my life's purpose. Like hundreds of times before, let's do this. And I would read that over and over again. And I would say it and I would feel it. And then I would imagine myself getting to that point of the speech where I bombed before and just, Mm -hmm. just pacing it, it, you know? Wow. And that was it. That's how I got through it. You just, you just, did you just read that off a, off a piece of paper or somewhere on your computer? 
Yeah, yeah, I have it on my Evernote. I just pull so it up every time I'm going to read it. You pull it up yeah. every time and you just read it out. That's that's absolutely yeah. incredible. It's an, it's yep. so powerful. Well, there was one part yeah. in there you said you're going to explain. What was that again? The Oh, capitalize on offers. So yes. uh, just a statement of, you know, and some people understand exactly what that means. An offer is something that comes at you, expected or unexpected per se. <laughs> so mm-hmm. okay. if somebody, like you had a heckler in the crowd or if the yeah. air conditioning wasn't working. In other words, anything that's offered to you, good or bad, because it, really it's neither until you make it so, mm-hmm. you can capitalize on that. So if something happens in the room, like let's say there's an annoying um, interruption. You Mm -hmm. could say to the room, every time guys, we hear that interruption, let that be a reminder (laughs) that you to, to bring, come back and focus on the speech. So rather than that being a distraction, let's let that be a reminder of our ability to focus. Yeah. And you're using that as an anchor. That's incredible. That's right. So that's called capitalizing on an offer. And that could be an offer could be a question from the crowd, a comment from the crowd, something happening in the room right? It could be temperature. It could be noises. It could be anything. The offer of the day. The, it could be a special day, a holiday. That's an offer. Hmm. And it's up to you to utilize it in a way that serves the group. Love it. Love it. What I want to do though, is I want to create like a bridge because obviously you shared about your your past and how you were, you know, underdeveloped physically. You started out in a country that was a completely different culture. You felt like a misfit. Um, and you wouldn't, you, you were not the kind of person that people would envision to be the person you are today, like getting up on stage in front of thousands of people. And, and I want to go into obviously more of, of, of who you are today, but I want to create that bridge for the people listening to, to, to figure out, like, I really want to kind of like reverse engineer. How did you go from being a back seater to a front rower? Like that's yeah. pretty much what I want to get. And I want my audience to take that from, to, from, from us today. 100%. So, I, I so. think that this was a matter of, well, there was, I always tell the story that there were three sort of events that happened in my life that I call the perfect storm that led to this big transformation. And one of which was I was laying in my room. It was in my early 20s or so. I was watching a TV commercial and it was for Tony Robbins. And it was the first time I'd ever seen Tony on TV. Yeah. Um, and anybody listening who doesn't know Tony, he's just a, he's a world class coach, uh, yeah. a life coach. Let's call him that. Well, just anyone listening for simplicity. To, anyone listening who doesn't know Tony Robbins, please come out of your rock that you're, that you've been living <laughs> so, under. <laughs> I, although I asked because I literally was in front of a room recently and I said, how many of you have ever heard of Tony Robbins? And 10% of the room put their hands what? up. 10%. What? It was incredible. Um, <laughs> no, it wasn't a personal growth conference right, because right. that group would have probably known. But anyway, so I'm laying there, I'm watching Tony. And my first reaction to this was, oh man, do people really buy this? I mean, come on. Like, <laughs> yes, I do have. people fall for this? Are they really going to spend this much money to like have somebody tell them like you're awesome? Mm-hmm. And the more that I listened to Tony, the more I was, I was pulled in and I thought, you know what? <laughs> Maybe this isn't a question of whether or not it's worth $200 for these CDs. But maybe the real question, Daniel, is am I worth $200 to find out? Hmm. And you see that moment for me was highly transformational because it was the moment I went from judging something or trying to be critical of the thing, whether or not it was worth it, to determining whether or not I was worth $200 to find out. See, I would have never invested that money in myself. But that day I said, you know what? I'm going to do it. That was a huge leap for me to spend $200. Then I spent the $200. I got the CDs and they were actually really good. Like I started listening every morning and every night, both to and from work. And I started to grow. I started to experience life. But here's what was fascinating. What Tony talked about on those CDs wasn't just about you getting more in your life, more money, more um, a better body, you know, better relationships. It was about what you were going to give to the world. That was an unexpected turn. Mm -hmm. It was like how much Tony talked about helping others along the way. And I had never really thought about it in that way. So I started growing myself. I started wanting to help other people. And here's what I noticed. That although I had a good job and I was doing amazing things, uh, you know, from an outsider's perspective looking in, I had an ideal life. Something was missing. There was a, a higher purpose or a deeper meaning that was that was was sort of nagging at me. Like there's got to be something else, and that thing was contribution. And I remember Tony saying, like on a one to ten scale, how would you rate your level of contribution? So that was a shift for me. Was mm-hmm. about giving. 
Now, the second thing that happened was that I was at a Jason Mraz concert <laughs> and I was in the very back row. I was in the balcony and I remember looking down to the front and I remember seeing this group of girls having the absolute time of their life. Mm. And I, I turned to my girlfriend at the time and I said, wow, look at that. Life is different in the front row. Yep. And I just saw this, this, the energy from the back to the front. You know, I, I watched the, the shift in the room from how people were experiencing life in the back and how people were experiencing life in the front. And to me, here's what I would also share with your audience is that the front row metaphor is one of getting close to the things that inspire you. This isn't a debate. And some people are like, well, if you're in the front row, you're still a spectator of life. And I say, <laughs> right. oh, I understand the simplicity of their argument. And here's what I would also say. There is, a, there is a way that you can attend an event where you become a participant when you're in the front row. I mean, mm -hmm. ask the band. Say, if, if the front row is going totally nuts, are they participating in the event? And you're like, sure. yes. The other thing about life is that people are like, I want to be on the stage of life. I don't want to be in the crowd. And I go, yeah, but when you live your life, so many times you're a, you're a, you're a fan. Anytime you ever watch the sunset, every time you watch your kids play, every time you watch somebody in admiration, every time you listen to a podcast, you are being witness to and being a fan of something in life. I mean, a lot of life is witnessing the beauty of appreciating mm -hmm. the beauty of being a great fan. And I watched that occur. It's, it's like what we do for others. Like there's only so much that we could be like, I want to be on stage for me because I'm awesome. And it's all about me being the star of the show versus like, how many times can we show up for other people? Can we live a life that's about serving other people and lifting others up and recognizing other people? Because when we do, I always say the best fans get the best show. Hmm. Like if you want to, right, you, you want to, you want to yeah. have fans, be a fan. You know, you want to have an amazing show in life, be a great fan. That's not about spectating. That's about participating where you get close to the people, places, and things that light you up. That's the metaphor. So this all hit me right at this show. That's the second mm -hmm. thing. And right. the third thing that happened was that my buddy and I decided that we were going to do this ultra marathon run. Now, not being runners, this was just about testing our limits. So we said we're going to run 52 miles. <laughs> and what ended up happening was this. We started training for the run, but... Uh, along the way, we just said, there's got to be something more, right? There's a theme here. You'll see it. It's a higher mm -hmm. purpose, deeper meaning. It's like, there's got to be something more than just us running far, right? Like that's, that's challenging and that's great, but what else? Yeah. So we're like, well, we should raise money for a charity. Well, now, Daniel, this is where it got interesting. The question, the question turned to, well, if we started a charity, what would it be? <laughs> then the question turned to, and this is the, the power of questions, right? The question turned to, well, if you start a charity, what's important to know? And I thought what's important to know is what you care most about and what you fear because fear and love are massive driving forces in our life. And if we're going to contribute, that if we can understand what we want to move away from or towards, that will give us fuel. So I said, what's one of my greatest fears? And I was like, one of my greatest fears is just having the ride end early life, you know, that just, just not, not feeling like I did all the things that I wanted to do before it was my time. And then one of my greatest loves is the experiences that I get to tell the stories of for years to come. I love creating moments that are like, man, that's a moment I'll never forget. I'm passionate about that. So what if we could help people who are fighting for their life have the best day of their life? Hmm. The minute we knew that, we decided it was Front Row Foundation. Now, Front Row Foundation, as you said, helps kids and adults who have a life-threatening illness see the event of their dreams from the front row. And we help them live every day in the front row because it's more than just a day. It's how we live every day of our lives. Well, my life started to really transform to answer your big question, which was when did this move from the back to the front when these things happened? So it was one, recognizing my need to contribute. Number two, it was recognizing that life was different in the front row. What would it look like for me to really step up in life big and get close to the things that mattered most to me? And then number three, it was the birth of the Front Row Foundation idea, which is how we would do this. And from that day forward, my life would never be the same. I had a purpose. I had a true calling that I was chasing. And that was what has pulled me forward the last 11 years since we started this journey. Wow. So that's so, a big answer. That's but it insane. Is the no, it's a great answer. But John, I would disagree with you. And I'll tell you why. Tell because, me. Yeah. Yeah, because you, what you said... And you're right that the ideas, meaning when you listen to those Tony Robbins, when you watch Tony Robbins on, 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 um, on the TV, 
That was your moment where you went, hmm, maybe this can help me. Maybe this can change something in my life. When you were sitting in the back and you saw those girls jumping up and enjoying life in the front row and you said, right, I've got to be a contributor to life. I can't just sit here in the back. I've got to go in the front. That was another moment where you, you had an idea, okay? And then the third idea was when you were running on the marathon and you said, hey, what if we create this charity where we can give uh, people who, are, who are, have you know, terminal illnesses a front row experience? That was an idea. All those three things you just mentioned were ideas and ideas are worthless without execution. So I would say that actually what changed the bridge between what you, where you were when you were in your teens or pre-teens, whatever it is, till now was actually the actions you took. It wasn't those ideas because guess what? I bet you every single person listening to this has seen a Tony Robbins TV, has sat in a crowd and wondered why they can't, you know, maybe be at the front or why can't they be on stage or why can't they, you know, create a podcast show or why can't they start a business or why can't they start a charity? But the difference between you and them is you did it. You paid $10,000 to go on a one-on-one coaching session with Tony Robbins. You actually picked yourself up, got yourself on stage. You actually started a charity, raised a million dollars. And that's the difference. Mm. I agree with that 100% that it is, it is uh, yeah, the, the, the decision or the idea is very important. But what's most important is that you do something with it. Yeah, right. 100% totally agree. So let me ask you this. What was it like the first experience? Because I would love to know how it felt when you, you, you started the charity. The first time, that, who was your first, how would I say? Um, I can't call it first recipient. Yeah, I was going to say client. Said, it's not yeah. A, yeah, recipient. What was, what was yeah. that like? Yeah, we call them recipients. This, her name was Effie Habaki. So uh, we lived, I was living in uh, New Jersey at the time. Uh, just outside of Philadelphia. And one of our friends, Mike, his mom was uh, battling uh, for her life. And we knew that. And so we wanted to make her the first recipient. And we sent her to go see a Brooks and Dunn concert in Atlantic City, a country music band. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I will tell you that it felt amazing that night for two reasons. One was that we decided that on the the night of her front row event, we were going to host a fundraiser to celebrate her night and to raise money for additional events. Amazing. And so we did that. So we had 200 of our friends gather together at a fire hall uh, where we had a couple of friends that were comedians and came in and performed. Some people made some baskets that we raffled off and we had a fundraiser that night and we celebrated Effie's life and the fact that she was seeing a front row event as that was happening. Now, the one thing that I'll never, never forget stands out for me was that Effie, when she got her tickets at the will call window, <laughs> uh, we had heard later from her and her husband, John, that when the, when the woman who slid the tickets across the counter to them, um, you know, saw that where they were sitting, mm -hmm. she said something like this. She said something like, hey, I don't know who you know <laughs> to have gotten these <laughs> tickets, but, but you must be somebody very special. And wow. then slid the tickets across the counter. Whew. And I thought, you know, that's a moment that I'll never forget because when you learn about tickets and what it means to be front and center, as an example, uh, that is almost impossible to get. Because literally, think about how many people deserve, quote unquote, those mm -hmm. tickets. Yeah. First of all, you have the band and the band and all their family and friends shouldn't they get the front, front and center? Right. Then you have the, the owner of the venue. In this case, it was a casino. So the president of the casino and all the executives, shouldn't they get access to front and center seats? But then about the, the radio stations that are promoting the show. I mean, they need front and center seats for their promotion of the show. But then there's also the people that buy the tickets. If you're a fan, shouldn't you be able to buy front and center seats? And what about the loyal fans that are part of their clubs, the ones that have been there for years? Shouldn't they get front and center? Like, I mean, it's like <laughs> yeah. when you think about yeah. all the people that are vying for those seats, that's why we've we've literally seen tickets sell for front and center at, at big shows, like for the most popular, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars wow. per ticket oh my to go sit in the front row. So, it, but that shows you the value, right? That's proximity yeah. is power. Real estate agents know that. It's like where, yeah. location, location, location. Yeah. It's all about that. So, so how do you, I mean, so you, besides for raising the money, do the uh, event owners give you a discount on it or are they involved in any way? Or is it just purely you have to pay for the tickets 
at the at the price that they they would normally charge we always begin with looking deeply and uh, extensively for donated tickets. So we have mm -hmm. a pretty established network of people that are highly connected, that are VIPs, that have given us the, the green light to say, when you need tickets, call me. Uh, we have direct connections to some pretty big you know, ticket agencies. Like we mm -hmm. have a direct connection to Live Nation. We have a direct connection to... Uh, and, Li and Live Nation owns Ticketmaster, right? They are the wow. they are the ticketing business, and so we have some direct connections, which are really powerful. We we also, um, you know, there's lots of ways that that can occur. There's lots of ways in to try to get tickets through managers or PR agents or whatever it might be. But if we get to the point to where we cannot get these tickets donated, we'll buy them. You know, that's what we have. That's what mm -hmm. we do. We buy them. We hope to never get to that place. But occasionally we have to buy the tickets because we right. just run into roadblock after roadblock. And so that's it. But the more right. tickets. So if somebody's listening, by the way, mm -hmm. and you yeah, have I was gonna say. <laughs> a connection to a sports team or a, a band or, or anything, a live performance, Broadway, you know, a theater, a theater theatrical performance, uh, feel free to email the charity at info at front row foundation dot org. Let us know what connection you have. We'll add you to a database so that when somebody comes to us and says, I want to see, you know, Celine Dion, we search our database for Celine Dion. And if anybody's ever raised their hand and said, I have a connection, we just call them or email them and say, hey, you said, you know, Celine Dion, here's the person. Could you try to make an introduction or help us out? That's how we've built that network. Wow. Let me ask you a really tough question here, because clearly I'd imagine that once you started getting the name out there, I'm assuming you got like tons and tons of emails and people writing in saying, oh, my uncle, my aunt, my child, my sister, my wife, my mother, my grandfather. How do you, what's your selection process? How do you turn people down? That For me, that would be the hardest thing. Like, oh, you know, my, my yeah. son's got, you know, whatever. And I'm just like, oh God, there's like a, you oh, know, we, how do you, you know, turn people down? Yeah. yeah. With um, a tremendous amount of sadness uh, in your heart to do that. It's never saying no to somebody is never fun nor easy to do. Um, that's the most difficult thing that we have to do. And we have a very well thought out process that would be our would be difficult to articulate the nuances to it. But yeah. essentially, here's how this works. Um, if somebody wants to nominate somebody for a front row event, they would go to frontrowfoundation.org. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a nomination form and they fill that out. Our team gets this form, reviews it, and works on a checklist that sort of piece by piece uh, lets us either say yes or no. And so there's a lot of factors that go into saying yes. For example, um, you know, do we have access to get those tickets? Because we never say yes unless we can get the tickets. Because nothing would be more disappointing than saying yes right. <laughs> and yeah. then pulling back. <laughs> And yeah, saying, sorry. yes, we can do this. Oh, no, we couldn't get tickets. Like, we never want to be that right. in that position. So can we get the tickets? Uh, do we have the manpower to pull it off? Because we have a certain staff that can do a certain number <coughs> excuse me, of events mm -hmm. every year. And, you know, if we are maxed and we have uh, – because our events are planned three, four, five months in advance at times. <coughs> and so, pardon me, I'm getting over a cold here. <laughs> that, that ultimately what happens is, can we pull it off with a staff? There's those types of questions that we have to answer. And then, and then if we cannot do it, we have to send a letter that says, we absolutely wish that we could do this, but, but presently we're unable to. And mm. they can check back in with us, but it is very, very hard to say no. And we try, we actually have run campaigns, Daniel, where it's called a help us say yes campaign. Because we tell people in our community that we don't want to say no. We have five people in queue. They all want events. We don't have the funds for it or the manpower. Help us say yes. And we help, we have, or we rally our community to try to figure out how we can say yes. So we work very hard to try to say yes as often as possible. It's incredible. You know, one of the things that I noticed is when you get on stage, um, a lot of times you ask the audience to hug someone else in the audience. And it oh, kind of yeah. like, it really struck me because I, 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 <laughs> awkward, you know, it's like, it's awkward, right? Oh, yeah. 
right? First of all, as a, as a person standing in the audience, it's <laughs> awkward, okay? You're putting me in an awkward position. But also, like, you on stage, like, the first time you ever did this, did you not think, uh-oh, what if no one does it? Like, what the hell? I'm going to look like a, such an idiot. Oh, yeah. Oh, right? it's a major risk, for sure. <laughs> Huge and risk. as a speaker, this is why I can get into a whole thing about, um, I could get into a lesson, by the way, about public mm-hmm. speaking and why that works. I want to hear it. I could actually articulate to somebody how exactly it is I'm able to get the entire crowd. And I've done, I've done this hundreds of times with mm-hmm. crowds anywhere from high school students to top level executives. Wow. And I've done it at uh, convocation ceremonies at universities where I have uh, professors in their full regalia, uh, police <laughs> no officers way. sitting on stage, parents in the crowd. I've had everybody hug. And it's all in the setup. That's what it is. It's all in the setup. You have to, I've really worked hard to figure out how to set up the hug so <laughs> that people will all do it. And it's also, Daniel, when it happens in your presentation. So if somebody's listening and they did a speech and they tried to do this six minutes into their talk, it would probably fail. If they didn't set it up the way that I do for about five minutes before the hug, it would probably fail. Mm-hmm. But I, I burst their fear bubbles. I, I give examples. I talk about it enough to where by the time that I say go, I've given, I've addressed every type of person in that room, what they might be feeling and how to deal with it. So it's that, not just hmm. stand up and hug somebody that would probably not work. I think that the, for me, if I was listening to this, um, I would want to know how do you break that? Meaning, I, you know, last, the last episode, I had a guy um, who talked about uh, getting into an elevator, right? Mm-hmm. And um, his name is Anil Gupta. He actually, he plays tennis with Richard sure. Branson and he yeah, sure. teaches yeah. happiness on, on Richard's Necker Island. It was a very, very, I, it, was a, it was an incredible um, um, conversation that we had. And at the heart of the conversation, I asked Anil, I said to him, you know, you, nothing phases you. You're like this just regular old guy who just goes up to any old celebrity and has no fear about it. I said to him, like, when you walk into an elevator, what do you do? Because I knew, I knew he would say something different because everybody else, as you know, we walk into an elevator and everybody just either jumps on their phones quickly because all of a sudden they've got a text message, yeah, <laughs> uh, right? All of a sudden, or they, they, fi- they suddenly find that this elevator is very unique. Those buttons look really interesting and the ceiling is so, <laughs> wow, look at that. And the floor looks so, nobody makes eye contact no everybody's scared to like look at everybody else and so i said anil what do you what do you do and he he was hilarious he goes well i walk into an elevator and i go i'm really sorry i'm late to this meeting (laughs) it's like that's how he breaks it down so Uh, i kind of want to like ask you like you seem to have really got this the science behind how do you break those fears down? How do you get someone essentially? Because I also noticed that all of your pictures on Google Images, if anyone wants to just check out John Vroman on Google and then look at his images, almost every one of them is you with this massive V shape, your hands way up in the air, exposing yourself. You know, for those listening that. Well, we have to hold on. Scared. You have to be careful. Exposing yourself could. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. like, wait a minute. Why is John exposing himself online? <laughs> <laughs> good, good call, John. Yeah, no, John is fully clothed, fully clothed, but uh, but he is <laughs> opening his hands in a V shape. How do you do that? How do you go from being, I guess, this you know self conscious person to getting on stage and and posing for pictures with this big V and just being being somebody who is who is so comfortable with himself that he's able to sort of break through everyone and like get people to hug police officers and, 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 you know, people in suits and ties who normally are very formal. How do you break that? That's what I would love to know. Well, I think there's two pieces to what we were just talking about. One is how do I get myself to do it? And then the other one is how do I get others to do it? And I can comment on both. You know, for me, it, my, my journey has been a 20 year investment into figuring out what were my limiting beliefs in life? How can I smash them? How can I adopt some new beliefs? And how can I evolve as a human being? I've invested, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, countless hours, 
there's been a lot of tears. There's been a lot of uh, happy moments and, and personal breakthroughs that I think have gotten to me, gotten to a place where I realized that whatever somebody thinks about me, and I'm going to say this just bluntly in, in a way that I'll have to articulate what it is, is that whatever somebody thinks about me has nothing to do with me. And let me mm. articulate what I mean. I get is it. That if somebody loves me, let's, 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 use, let's use actually just physical appearance. If one person looked at me and said, he's the most handsome guy in the world, mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with me. Same as if somebody said he's the ugliest guy in the world, that has nothing to do with me. And let me explain. Because two people looking at the same guy with drastically different experiences are because it's all about how they view me. It's about their own personal feelings about it. So it has nothing to do with me. Now, if somebody could argue, well, you caused it. You were there. You were the <laughs> reflection. I understand that I'm the, I, I might be the object of that story. But the point is, it has nothing to do with me from my experience of life, except for how I interpret their response or whatever that means. So when somebody comes up to me at the end of the speech and says, John, that was the best speech ever. I have to remember that that doesn't have to do with me. That just means that there was a light inside them that was created that they now feel good about and they associate that light to me. And I might have asked a question or whatever, but it's the point is it's their light. So when somebody comes and says that was the best speech ever, you rock. I say, you know what makes me so happy to see you so happy. Hmm. But why I share that is such a big piece of this is that the reason I can stand up in front of the room and feel great is because I recognize that whatever their response is, is their response. Now, yes, do I influence? Yes, do I understand that I can create energy in a room and that I can, by the way I show up, I can serve? I recognize that also, um, it's like Marianne Williamson's famous poem that says, when we let our own light shine, we give others permission to do the same. Mm -hmm. And that if I'm really a true servant to the world, that one of the best ways that I can serve is to show up a uh, feeling of value and displaying what I ultimately want them to feel. So if I want people to feel valuable, isn't it important that I display that? Isn't it, if I want people to feel worthy of a front row life, shouldn't I be the one to display that? Wouldn't it be highly incongruent if I didn't show up that way? So I view that one of the ways is not just serving me, it's the way I get to serve the world by, by uh, holding myself accountable to showing up a certain way because our actions are so much louder than our words. And so that to me is a critical piece of why I show up that way, because it wasn't about me anymore. See, earlier in my life, it was about me. Why me, poor me, mm -hmm. um, am I good enough? It was a lot of me focus, and now it is me focus, but because it affects other people, because it's the way I show up in the world. So I think that's how I show up. And how I help other people do that is I understand pacing and leading. I understand that if I can match and mirror somebody to a certain point and then I can lead them, what, how I get to the hug is I start off with something simple like turn to somebody around you and say something, which is very low barrier to entry, not a lot of right. intimidation. Then I might have them turn to somebody around them and give them a high five. Hmm. Then I might have them turn to somebody around them and ha ask them a question. And see, I stage up my level of involvement hmm. up until the end of the speech, when then what I do is I say, all right, in a moment, I'm going to have all of you stand up and hug. And then I tell them that, and then I pause for a second, and then I set this up. I say, now some of you in the room, all I had to do is say, you're going to hug, and you're already excited. I already know that some people in the room are like, this is the best moment of the whole day. And I said, how many of you without any prep needed, you are ready to hug the person around you? And I hold my hand up and then other people put their hand up. Hmm. I say, exactly. I know that many of you are, don't even need any prep and you're ready to go. So I solidify that group. Then I also say, I know some of you and I can see by the look in your eye that you're like, no way am I standing <laughs> up and hugging the person to my left or my right. No way. And I, la and I just say, I understand. And I say, I remember one time, and I tell a story about a guy who looked at me with this you know, look of like, no way. And then after the speech, he walked up to me and, and he said, this was the greatest speech ever. And I said, what did you like? And he said, it was the hug. But the way I tell the story, it's really funny and it's wow. crowds laughing. And I tell the story about somebody that had a transformational moment. See, what I'm doing is I'm just, I'm paving the way for possibility. And so I talk about that and I talk about, hey, if, if somebody around you stands up, um, and they're really slow to stand up and they look like this is their least favorite part of the day. That just means they need extra love from all of you. And everybody laughs and they're joking. <laughs> and I'm like, so I just tee this up in different ways. And I said, trust me, I understand there's introverts and extroverts in the room. And some of you, this is a real stretch 
in your mm-hmm. life, you know, to be able to do this. And I, and I, and, and, and depending on the crowd, I'll even say, listen, if there's any reason that you can't hug, like literally you, you can't jump up out of your seat, you have a broken rib for a religious reason that I'm unfamiliar with that. You're just like, I cannot touch somebody. Then mm-hmm. just, I give them an out. I'm like, just either just wave. And that's <laughs> your cue that you can't hug that person for whatever reason you don't know. Mm-hmm. I could do that. Sometimes I don't do that at all, but it depends yeah. on the group. I might offer that. And I say, now listen, nobody use that as an excuse to not play the game. This is about stretching yourself and stepping up. But if you, but if, but if for this reason you can't do it, then just do this, right? Or sometimes I'll laugh and joke. I'll say, if you can't do this exercise, you should run and hide right now because you're about to get attacked. <laughs> and I'll say, and people exactly just like you, they laugh and it's all in the setup. So then I say, here's what we're going to do. And then, oh, by the way, and I keep setting it up. I say, when you jump up, here's how to hug. I literally mm-hmm. pull somebody from the front of the room. I no show way. them how to hug. I do the no butt out space in between your body. <laughs> no bro hugs where you put your arm to block your body from touching theirs. I say, right. I want the good two or three second hug. And it's all about the setup. How this relates to your audience, Daniel, mm. is that we have to recognize how to match somebody where they are and that by being a storyteller, by asking interesting questions, by giving people time to evolve, that we, we, we set them up for success. I think we do that with, with our kids sometimes. It's like, I, I know that if I set something up properly for my son Tiger at age seven, that the chances of him doing it successfully, as an example, go through the roof because of how I teed it up. It's the things I say leading up to it, the things that the questions that I might ask or the anticipation factor that the tee up. So just like our events, let me relate this back to our front row events. When we have a front row experience, a lot of the work that makes the day magical happens in advance. Just like in the speech of setting it up, it's like, here's what's going to happen. Here's your day. We get to know our recipient well. We understand like, hey, in front of a camera on a one to 10 scale, how much do you love having your picture being taken? We understand all these things before we even get to their front row day. What are their favorite colors, their favorite smells, their favorite foods? Like if they could pick the temperature of their car ride, what would a perfect temperature be? So we understand people so much that being a moment maker, which is what our whole deal is about, goes through the roof because we know somebody. That's like a practical example would be if you wanna recognize your staff on your team, if you lead a team of people, knowing your people allows you to recognize them in the way they want to be recognized. That's the love languages, that's Gary Chapman. That's the idea of getting along with your spouse. You wanna have a huge, fantastic Valentine's Day, which is record this is tomorrow, you know, yeah. for many people who are celebrating or whatever it is, a, a birthday, a Christmas, a holiday, know the person you're serving. So Hmm. to be a great speaker, to be a great leader, to be a great moment maker, you have to know your audience and then you have to be able to show up for in a way for them that allows them a chance to succeed. Does that make sense? It makes a hundred percent sense. And I think, do you know what, John, do you know why I think it works for you and why it wouldn't necessarily work for most people? I think it actually has to do with the fact that you genuinely, genuinely want them to hug because it's going to help them. Not because you're going to look good. Not because people are going to go, oh, do you see John Vroman's speech? Like, do you see how he got everyone to hug? Wow, John Vroman's awesome. And people, because I feel like a lot of people, the reason why they fail is because they're trying to blow themselves up and everybody doesn't, like, everybody wants to, to be special. And if you make it your mission to make other people special, they're going to love you for it. And that's that. That I think is is the truth. I think it's that you genuinely, really, really just want people to break out of their self consciousness and just really embrace someone else, and break through their their comfort zone. And you know, an incredible example of this. I recently um, I was scrolling down my Facebook uh, feed, and for once there was actually something of interest that actually uh, you know did something for me that day, <laughs> as opposed to all the other crap that's out there. Um, it said. Um, I can't remember exactly, I'm going to paraphrase, but it said something like, um, not your average Super Bowl or something like that. I'm going to post it in the, in the, in the show notes for those listening so you can actually check it out. I, I highly recommend you do because it, it, I was literally in tears, uh, but I clicked on it and because it was obviously everybody was talking about Super Bowl, Super Bowl, Super Bowl, Super Bowl, right? And I'm British, so I'm like, what the hell is this all about? But anyway, this guy videos himself and the beginning of the video is basically him in, a, in his bedroom going, 
hey Mike, yeah, I'll meet you at the soup bar, yeah, I'll, I'll bring some wings and we'll have a great time and beer and whatever it is, right? And actually what he does, because that's what everybody does, everyone calls their friends, like, let's go hang out, watch soup bar. What this guy does is he goes onto the streets of New York, okay, and he walks up to homeless men, well, homeless men and women, and he goes to each one and he says, hey man, you watching the Super Bowl tonight? And usually they go, uh, no, I'm not, no. Um, and he's like, oh man, why not? He's like, oh, I don't have a, I don't have anywhere to to see it. And he said, well, why don't you, why don't you come with me and 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 you know, we'll watch Super Bowl together. And they're just like, for real, man? And he's like, yeah, yeah, for real. There'll be food, and we'll be in a nice warm room, and and and, and it'll be it'll be awesome. You should you should definitely come. And they're like, are you serious, really? And he's like, yeah. And, and then you see in the video, there's about eight or nine of these homeless men. And he brings them into this like really cool, like high rise building to the rooftop. And he's like basically hired this like room with this massive widescreen TV with hot dogs and, and different foods and beverages and beer and everything. And you see these guys and he also takes out Patriots shirts. Like he takes these shirts, he buys a bunch of shirts. You see him buying the shirts as well before. And they all put it on, they put it on top of their like, you know, big overcoats. You know how the, you know, the homeless look, they have the big overcoats. And, and they, they, put, they pull this like t-shirt over them and they're all sitting there and they're enjoying the game and then they're eating and they're enjoying it. And then he takes them in, in half time, he takes them to, to the rooftop and they're all standing there and they're overlooking Manhattan. And they're just like, wow, wow, it's beautiful. And he says to them, what, has none of you been up here none of you have seen like the, the skyline and they're like no this is this is this is so awesome and then he takes them back down and they're like high-fiving each other and and then you know of course they, they win and everybody's jumping up and they, they give each other a hug and then he's like and and and, the, and and then they say you know thanks so much man and you, you could see like they, when they hug him you, this man gave them a, a, a space in their life that they've never experienced. Nobody cared for them. Everybody's sitting there on Super Bowl night and they're just in their own little bubble, in their own warm home with their food and their friends and their TV. And these guys would have been on the street. But this guy, he did something different. He said, I'm going to change that. And you know, that video reminds me of you, John, because that's exactly what you do. You go out there and you, you, see, you see the beauty in giving. It, that's it. That's what, that's what separates you from so many other people is that you, you've, you've, you've got it. You realized it. You realized that the only way to get out of me is to get out of me, is to go and give to other people. And I mean, I'm just sitting here and I'm listening to you and I'm, I'm so humbled by you, John. Really, I am. And I, I think it's absolutely incredible. And this whole, you did this retreat for dads. Uh, you know, can you can you share with our audience as well? Because I want I want I want them to understand for the for the men out there, and also for the people who have dads, or for the women who are listening, your husbands. You got to get them on this retreat. John, can you share with our audience the the dads retreat? Oh yeah, this is uh, one of my favorite things to talk about because if it relates to family, it's uh, it's got my attention. You know, this was um, this retreat was designed as much for me as it is for all the guys, and perhaps you could argue even more because I got to this place in my life where I recognized um, when somebody had asked me one time at a it was a party or wherever I was, they said, "What do you do?" And I was originally going to go into my spiel about you know speaking and running this charity, and I just was like, "Wait a minute, no, hold on, I'm a I'm a dad." And when I'm not doing that, I happen to be doing the speaking and running a charity. But it was the way I prioritized my comment about what I do in life and what it was. That's really what they're that, that's not what they're expecting me to say. But that's how I wanted to phrase it. I remember looking at my computer one time and I had a folder for all these things in my life, you know, taxes and the charity and my business. But there was no folder where I would intentionally plan my family's year out. And I wouldn't think, you know, I wasn't sitting down and constantly every quarter looking at my family values and how was I showing up and how was I intentionally designing my family life? I was spending a lot of time in my family, 
but not a, t- a lot of time working on my family. And then I looked mm. at my calendar and I was like, man, I, last year I invested in this speaker training and I went to this coaching thing and I went to this personal growth event, but I didn't have a single event to help me be an amazing father. Yeah, that might've been a part of those events, but not like focus. If so, if this is my number one role in life, why wouldn't I take two or three days out of an entire year, 1%, 2% of my entire year per se, and mm. Go focus on being a dad. And that's what we did. We put together a small group of men that would come together that want to form a brotherhood around the topic of developing a deep sense of purpose as a father and then sharing some strategies for for family success as they would define it for themselves. And that's what we did. And we had our first event last fall. It sold out you know, almost instantly. We have another event coming up in March, which I don't know when this will air, but it's March here in Austin, Texas, where I live. And then um, we'll have another one in the fall of 2017. This, will, this is going to air, I think, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So there should be uh, Great. enough time. Yeah. So the link yeah will then be if the there's notes. a dad listening or you know a dad, send them mm-hmm. to frontrowdads.com because that site has a, a quick video that explains it. You'll get exactly what the feel of the event is and you can apply right there to attend the event. And um, we have, we have, we're about 75% full right now. So we have a wow. couple of spots open if somebody wants to take a peek. But man, that's been such an epic journey. And you're a dad. You, you know, we gotta get you there sometime, <laughs> Daniel. That'd be great yeah. to have you. Yeah, for sure. I've got four kids. I know it's yeah. a journey. <laughs> it's the journey it's, for you, man. It's definitely a journey. Yeah. And you also just launched a new book, which is really exciting because I'm mm-hmm. sure a lot of a lot of my listeners, are, including myself, we're going to want to grab that book. It's called The Front Row Factor. Um, I guess give us a, a, a quick blurb um, what the oh, book yeah. is about. Yeah, sure. hundred um, percent. So the book uh, has been, you could say, has been 11 years in the making because this is the mm-hmm. story of the Front Row Foundation. It's These are fascinating stories of people that we've served. It's incredibly moving science that backs up the, uh, the big ideas that we've shared. And it gives these practical strategies for how we can all be what we call moment makers in our lives. And we think about like, your life is just made up of millions and millions of these moments. And how can we make the most of each one of them? Most of us feel like we're just scrambling day to day, but how could we intentionally design our days? How could we look at each day and say, in the morning, what are my, how can I create a front row life today? You know, what will be the front row moments I can create? And then throughout the day to be asking ourselves the questions of how can we create front row moments right now? What does that look like to do that? And then at the end of the day, celebrating those moments, you know, what were my front row moments and looking back and celebrating them. Um, We teach the framework for people to become moment makers in their lives. And we're using what what's so fascinating about the book is that it's told through the compelling stories of those people that we've served. So, I mean, the riveting, uh, you know, I, I would say uh, what's riveting about it is the way in which these people show up in their life. I say to people, it's everything we've learned about living life from people fighting for it. Hmm. And I've never been more proud of a project in my life. I'm so excited about this book. Uh, it's uh, pre-orders available on Amazon February 28th. And then the book officially ships on March 28th. And we're just over the moon about wow. um, honoring the the community, the what we call the front row family that's worked so hard in 11 years to try to make all these events possible. Hmm. And there's a quote that actually I saw from you, which which really I think sums it all up, which is, there are no failures in life just moments of discovery. I yeah, love that's it. That's right. Absolutely yeah, love it. 100%. John, what's the best way for my listeners to get in touch with you? Uh, everything is at frontrowfactor.com. They can get ac- access to all of the resources that we have there. The book is there, the dad's retreat and everything else. Uh, frontrowfactor.com. We'd love to connect. Very cool. And all the links, um, including all the resources that we mentioned in this show, will be in the show notes. If you go to danielgeffen.com forward slash 61, that's danielgeffen.com forward slash 61. Also, if you want to pick John's brain, um, you can if you join my Facebook group. It's Can I Pick Your Brain? So if you go into Facebook, just do a search, Can I Pick Your Brain? Join the group. I'll accept you if you're a, if you're a fan. And uh, I believe John is in the group. If he's not, then I will add him after the show. Um, and um, that's pretty much, I mean, John, this has been really, really inspirational for me. Thank you so much for letting me pick your brain. Thank you to all my fellow listeners and brain pickers. I'm looking forward to the day when I'll be You've picking been listening to your the brain. Can I Pick Your Brain podcast. Inspiration without perspiration is like a tiger without teeth. So to put these ideas into action, head over to danielgeffen.com.